everyone to the kickoff session, session number one for the new series, Discover NLP with Python. Um, thank you so much to our leaders, uh, myself, uh, Rishika Singh, I'll be presenting for today's session. Um, and then we also have Yashika and Ramya also helping us as panelists. And um, all three of us have been putting a lot of work into this series along with other leadership from the Python track. Um, so thank you to um, all the amazing teamwork. And before I get into the content, um, here's just some more information about Women Who Code. So our mission is inspiring women to excel in technology careers. And our vision is a world where women are representative as technical executives, uh, founders, VCs, board members, and software engineers. And our target are engineers with two or more years of experience that are looking for support and resources to strengthen their influence and to level up in their careers. And we do have a code of conduct, which can be found um, along with our incident report at this link right here. We do take this very seriously because Women Who Code is an inclusive community. And um, all of our events, including this one, are intended to inspire women who would like to excel in their own careers. And anyone who is there for this purpose is very uh, welcome. And we do not tolerate any sort of harassment. And some more stats on Women Who Code. So we have 230,000 members. We have 70 networks in 20 countries, members in 97 plus countries, more than 10,000 events, um, daily conference tickets um, priced at more than $1,000, scholarships valued at $2 million, as well as access, access to jobs and resources and infinite connections. And lastly, our movement is as the world changes, we can be a connecting force that creates a sense of belonging while the world is being asked to isolate. So with that, um, I'm going to jump in for today's session, which will be NLP foundations. So we're going to be going over the fundamental concepts of NLP, general applications, as well as going into some pre-processing. And we're actually going to be putting this into action. Um, so the first half of today's session will be more theoretical. I'll be going through some slides and then we'll take a little five minute break and then jump into some coding using Google Colab. So the agenda is what is NLP, then we'll go into where it's used, some challenges in understanding natural language text, then I'll go through some description of the general NLP workflow, and today we'll be focusing specifically on exploratory data analysis, or EDA, and pre-processing, and then we're actually going to be applying both of these um, in action with a Google Colab notebook, which will be in the second half, and then we'll do some recap and then next steps. So to start out with, what is NLP? Um, NLP is a subfield of computer science and artificial intelligence that's concerned with interactions between computers and human or natural languages. Um, and it is used to apply machine, machine learning algorithms to text and speech. So NLP allows humans to bypass programming languages to speak to computers and instead use normal human speech. So it basically breaks down the barriers of communication by allowing anyone, whether they have computing knowledge or not, to talk to bots, systems, apps, or any kind of software. And machine learning help, can help NLP power systems adjust actions according to the historical con context and the patterns that it picks up in any conversations. For instance, if I ask a banking bot to pay my electric bill and that request happens to fall near the 25th of each month for three straight months, then the bot can anticipate my request and actually automate this task. And so NLP technology is very human-like in the sense that more conversation can lead to better comprehension. Um, there's several examples of applying NLP to create systems, including speech recognition, machine translation, spam detection, autocomplete question answering, and predictive typing. And nowadays, majority of us have a device that uses one of these systems. For instance, Cortana from Microsoft, Siri from Apple, um, Alexa and Amazon, as well as the spam filter in your Gmail account. And now I'll jump into just a brief overview of the, of the timeline for, for NLP. Um, so this dates back to the 1600s where two philosophers, Leibniz and Descartes, actually proposed theoretical codes in relation to language. And then in the 1930s, uh, there was patents submitted for translating machines where George R. Struni applied to build an automatic bilingual dictionary. And Peter Taransky proposes another dictionary that processes variations in grammar across languages. Then in the 1940s, machine translation was actually used in hopes to actually break codes in World War II, where they translated Russian into English, although the results were unsuccessful. 
And then in 1950, Alan Turing publishes his very uh, significant computing machinery and intelligence, which helped to outline the concept of the Turing test. And then in 1957, Noam Chomsky releases the syntactic structures, which helps to advance in linguistic studies with the universal grammar rule. Then in 1966, Eliza, a computer psychotherapist and the first bot is created by Joseph Weizenbaum. And then in 1968 to 1970, we have SHRDLU, which is an early NLP program, which was developed at MIT and helped to allow computers and people to converse, but there were some restrictions in that. And then from 1970 to 80, Roger Shank introduced the conceptual dependency theory for NLP. William A. Woods releases the Augmented Transition Network to show natural language inputs. And then a wealth of bots are written, which includes Perry. In the 1980s, the first statistical machine translation systems are developed. Strict and complex handwritten rules are swapped for newly developed algorithms, which helps to increase the computer's understanding. And then in the 1990s to 2000s, programmers developed models to increase the capabilities of computers using NLP. And in 2006, IBM creates its AI software, which is Watson. And this went on to win competitions against the best human contest contestants in 2011. And then coming a little, a little bit closer to time, um, in 2010 to 2020, people introduced technologies that utilize NLP into their homes, such as Siri, Alexa, and 2017 actually marks the rise in chatbot integration into business operations. And then from present, looking into the future, we have this rising adoption rate of AI-powered bots for customer-facing roles. And NLP will continue to develop so that communication with computers will be as effortless as human interactions. So from there, I'm going to go uh, briefly into where is NLP used. So one uh, very important domain is mach machine translation, which is the task of automatically converting one natural la language into another. Um, but in doing so, you're actually preserving the meaning of the input text and producing fluent text in the output language. So while machine translation is one of the oldest subfields of AI research, there is a recent shift towards large scale, not large scale empirical techniques. And this has led to very significant improvements in the quality of the translation. Um, with this, there are, however, some challenging aspects. First, there's a large variety of languages, alphabets, and grammars. The task to translate a sequence of words or characters to another sequence is actually harder for a computer than simply working with numbers alone. And lastly, there is no one correct answer. For example, if you're translating from a language without gender dependent pronouns, he and she can actually be the same. Next, we have text classification, which is the process of assigning tags or categories to text according to its content. So text classifiers can be used to organize, structure, and categorize pretty much anything you can imagine. It is one of the fundamental tasks in NLP with broad applications such as sentiment anal analysis, topic labeling, spam detection, and intent detection. Um, text classification can be done in two different ways. We have manual and automatic. Um, so in manual, you can think of a human annotator that's actually interpreting the content of the text and then categorizing it accordingly. This method can usually provide um, high quality results, but it's very time, time consuming and expensive. On the other hand, we have automatic classification, which applies machine learning, NLP, and other techniques to automatically classify text in a faster and much more cost effective way. Um, so next we have sentiment analysis, and this is a context contextual mining of text which identifies and extracts subjective information in source material. It is the most common text classification tool that analyzes an incoming message and tells whether the underlying sentiment is positive, negative, or neutral. Um, it allows businesses to identify customer sentiment towards products, brands, or services in online conversations and feedback, and that's just one example of where this is used. And sentiment analysis models focus on polarity, uh, which is positive, negative, or neutral, but also on feelings and emotions, such as angry, happy, sad, etc. And even on intentions, such as interested versus not interested. And so how does it work? Um, training, uh, so we have the training phase and the prediction phase. So in the training phase, the model learns to associate a particular input, for example, a text, to the corresponding output or a tag. And this is based on the test samples that are used for training. The feature extractor transfers a text input into a feature vector. And then we get these pairs of feature vectors and tags. And these tags can be you know, positive, negative, neutral, something like that. 
So these pairs of the vectors and the tags are then fed into the machine learning algorithm to then generate a model. From here, we get to the prediction phase. So the feature extractor is then used to transform unseen text inputs into feature vectors. And then these vectors are fed into the model, which help to generate predicted tags. Again, positive, negative, or neutral, or whatever the user chooses to decide. Um, and so just looking at NLP in our everyday lives, some very common examples are email assistance when you ask Siri anything, um, you know, uh, basic question answering systems. And then here are some um, pretty amazing applications. I'm not going to go too much into depth um, on these right now, but they're actually pretty amazing what you can do with NLP. Um, and that just covers just the, just the surface of what you can do. Um, and here's kind of just a little comic that I found to be um, really interesting. Um, and uh, I'll give everyone a moment just to, to read through that, but I found that pretty, pretty interesting and, and uh, relevant to, to NLP in, in today's world. So from there, I'm going to go into challenges in understanding natural language text. Um, I actually wanted to um, send out a poll. Um, I think uh, perhaps, Karen or Yashika can send that out. We just have one question just to sort of see where are people are coming from, what level of familiarity they have. Um, let me just send that out. So I just launched a poll. I just wanna see kind of what is your level of familiarity with NLP? I'm just curious to see kind of um, are people uh, have some sort of exposure? Are they completely new to it? Um, if they're an expert in NLP and perhaps know way more than I do. Um, and so I'll give it just a few more seconds before I end the poll. Um, okay, so let me end the poll. All right, so it seems like a good majority of people have um, I've heard of NLP and, of, uh, and know a few basic concepts, but are perhaps looking to get a bit more advanced, which is, which is great. Um, I think, you know, in this um, series, what we're aiming for today, we're kind of just sending, um, you know, setting out, just laying out the foundation um, for this entire series. And then for every session after this, we're going to be going a little bit deeper into it, combining NLP with deep learning, and um, as well as uh, the various applications of NLP, as I mentioned with sentiment analysis, and perhaps even doing a project later on. Um, so let me get back to the presentation. So there are a few challenges in understanding um, natural language text. The first is ambiguity, which is an intrinsic, intrinsic characteristic of human conversations, which is particularly challenging in natural language understanding scenarios. Um, this is basically when you know, sentences can have multiple alternative representations. Um, there are different forms of ambiguity that are relevant in natural language and AI systems. Um, and in AI theory, the process of handling ambiguity is called disambiguation. And to solve this problem, NLP offers several methods, such as evaluating the context or introducing parts of speech tagging. However, understanding the semantic meaning of the words in a, fra in a phrase remains an open task. Next, we have synonymity, and this challenge arises from the fact that we can express the same idea with different terms, which are also dependent on a specific context. For example, the words big and large can be synonyms when describing an object or a building, but they are not interchangeable in all contexts, since big can mean older or grown up in phrases like big sister, while large does not have this meaning and could not just be simply substituted here. So in an NLP tax, tasks, it is necessary to incorporate the knowledge of synonyms and different ways to name the same object or phenomenon, especially when it comes to high level tasks that are mimicking human dialogue. Um, then we have co-reference and specifically co-reference resolution, which is the process of finding all expressions that refer to the same entity in a task. Um, it is an important step for a lot of higher level NLP tasks that involve natural language understanding, such as document summarization and information extraction. Um, it has been notoriously difficult for NLP researchers, but it has been revived recently um, with the advent of cutting edge techniques of deep learning and reinforcement learning. Um, and currently it has been argued that co-reference resolution may be instrumental in improving the performances of NLP neural architectures like RNNs um, and LSTM models. 
And now we have syntactic rules. So knowledge about the structure and syntax of a language is helpful in, in many areas like text processing, annotation, and parsing for further operations such as text classification or summarization. And very, some typical parsing techniques for understanding text syntax include parse speech tagging, shallow parsing or chunking, constituency parsing, and dependency parsing. Um, I'm not going to go too much into depth into each of these, but in the next few slides, there's just some diagrams, which taking the same example of um, this phrase that we have here and kind of steps through kind of what each of them look like when we apply each of these um, techniques. So here we have parts of speech tagging, where basically we're going through this entire sentence and tagging it with the appropriate parts of speech, such as adjective, noun, verb, etc. Then we have shallow parsing or chunking, where you can kind of see that we have this central unit, everything is sort of branching out from there. And from there, we're basically assigning each component of the sentence to um, each of these sort of sub branches. Then we have dependency parsing, which again, we have these tags associated with it, but we sort of have these dependencies between different components of the sentence itself. Um, and then lastly, we have constituency parsing, which again, we kind of have this root component and then everything sort of branches out from there. But again, we do have these sorts of tags associated to each uh, individual word in our original sentence. And so now I'm going to go into the NLP workflows. So typically any NLP based problem can be solved by this methodical workflow that has a sequence of steps. So we usually start out with a corpus of text documents and follow standard processes of text wrangling and pre-processing. And then we get into parsing and basic exploratory data analysis. And then based on the initial insights in these two phases, we usually represent the text using relevant feature engineering techniques. And then depending on the problem at hand, we either focus on building predictive supervised models or unsupervised models, and which usually focus more on pattern mining and grouping. And then finally, we actually get to evaluating the model and the overall success criteria with the relevant stakeholders or the customers, and then we can finally deploy that model for any further usage. So today's uh, uh, content will mostly focus on these first two um, these first two steps of the pre-processing and exploratory data analysis, um, and then we'll actually, we're actually going to be doing these in practice uh, with the Colab notebook. So uh, we have some steps for exploratory data analysis, um, which is describing the data, getting some information on the data, and basic visualization, as well as these six steps for pre-processing. And then from there, uh, I'll briefly go into the rest of the steps of the workflow. So as I mentioned, we have feature extraction, which is converting text to features. So this is kind of the secret sauce to creating superior and better performing, better performing machine learning models. Um, and this is even more important for any data that is unstructured. And the main problem in working with NLP is that the algorithms cannot work on the raw text directly. So that's why we actually need these feature extraction techniques to convert text into a mechanism into a matrix or a vector of features. And some of the most popular methods of feature extraction are bag of words and TF-IDF, which stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency Vectorizer. And then next we have modeling. Um, this is basically um, where we have a system that uses statistical methods to build its own knowledge bank, and then is trained to make associations between a particular input and its corresponding output. We also need to transform the text examples into something that a machine can actually understand, um, which are these vectors that we get from the feature engineering stage. Um, and so when the texts have been transformed into vectors, they are then fed into the algorithm together with the expected output or tags to then create this classification model. From there, the, the model can uh, discern which features best represent the text, and then it can make predictions on any unseen data. And lastly, we evaluate the model. So we actually have two different types, um, or I guess two different like subtypes. So we have intrinsic versus extrinsic and automatic versus manual. So intrinsic means you're measuring the performance of an NLP component on its defined subtax. And this is usually against a defined standard in some reproducible laboratory setting. Then we have extrinsic, where you actually focus on the component's contribution to the performance of a complete application. And this typically involves the participation of a human in the loop. And then we have automatic versus manual evaluation. In automatic, we evaluate the NLP system by comparing its output with some gold standard or some highly desired model. 
And this can be repeated as often as needed without additional costs on the same input data. However, the definition of what a gold standard is, is a pretty complex task. Then we have manual evaluation, which is performed by human judges, which are instructed to estimate the quality of a system or most often of a sample of its output based on a number of criteria that is determined by the developers of the model. The human judges can be considered as the reference for a number of natural language processing tasks. And so this is more of a subjective evaluation as compared to our automatic evaluation, which is highly objective. And from there, I'll be going into the exploratory data analysis and our pre-processing steps. So the main goal um, in EDA is, um, is this process of exploring data, generating insights, testing hypotheses, checking assumptions, and revealing underlying hidden patterns in the data. And so through these goals, we can get a basic description of the data, visualize it, identify patterns in it, identify potential challenges of using, of using the data, and even more. And so today we'll be working with this um, SMS spam versus ham data set, which is a retrieved from the UC Irvine Machine Learning Repository. Um, so it's a pub public collection of SMS labeled messages that have been collected for mobile phone spam search. So basically we're going to, uh, we won't be actually building a model or doing any classification. We're just going to be um, applying our EDA and pre-processing on this data set. So for EDA, the first component is describing that data. So we get a basic description of the data. Um, you can sort of interpret it as this quick and dirty way to get some information on your data as a way of getting some simple, easy to understand information or to get a basic feel. And you can also generate word clouds just like this. And it kind of helps to get some very simple, high level, high level understanding. Um, data information is another component. You can get the number of training versus testing instances. Um, if it's some sort of classification um, data set, you can see how well balanced is the data set to begin with, um, what are the different dimensions of the data, is there any missing data or perhaps missing labels of the instances. And then last for EDA, we have basic visualization, um, which can help by identifying patterns in the data. The two Python libraries, Seaborn and Matplotlib, are very highly used, and they're also very nice and uh, easy and quick ways to achieve this basic visualization. And then for our pre-processing steps, we have six steps. So first we have noise cleaning, and this is one of the key steps in processing language data. And this is where we remove the noise so that the machine can more easily detect the patterns in the data. So text, text data contains a lot of noise, and this takes the form of special characters, such as um, the pound sign, punctuation, numbers, um, all of which are different for computers to understand if they are present in the data. So therefore, we need to process the data to remove these elements. Additionally, it is also important to apply some attention to the casing of words. So if we include both uppercase and lowercase versions of the same words, then the computer will see them as different entities, even though they may still be the same. Um, and then tokenization, we're going to be using the NLT, um, the NLTK, which is the natural language toolkit, uh, which has sort of this um, inbuilt uh, function where you can very easily take this sort of basic sentence, hi, I would like to tokenize this sentence. And then the output looks like this, where every single word and the punctuation in it is um, separately tokenized. And then the third step is spell checking. Um, this is obviously a very important uh, step for pre-processing, and there are a number of ways to number of ways to achieve this. Uh, we'll, we will be using Microsoft's Text Blob um, library, uh, which is just one of many ways, and this is a very simple spelling correction mechanism. Then we have contraction mapping, and so contractions are shortened versions of words or syllables, such as "don't" for "do not." Um, they often exist in either written or spoken forms in the English language, and so these shortened versions or contractions of words are created by removing specific letters and sounds. In the case for English contra contractions, they are often created by removing one of the vowels from the word. Examples would be, as I said, do not to don't, or I would to I'd, uh, with, a with an apostrophe in the middle. So converting each contraction to its expanded original form actually helps with text standardization. And then we have stemming and lemmatization. So stemming is a process of reducing words to their root form. For example, the words rain, raining, and rained have very similar and in many cases the same meaning. So the process of stemming will actually reduce these three to the same root form of rain. This is again a way to reduce noise and the dimensionality of the data 
And again, we can leverage the NLTK library, which has built in methods to perform this task of stemming. Then we have lemmatization, which has the same goal as stemming in that it aims to reduce words to their root form. However, stemming is known to be a fairly crude method of doing this. So lemmatization, on the other hand, is a tool that performs the full morphological analysis to more accurately find the root or the lemma for a word. And again, here we can leverage NLTK, which can be used to perform the task of lemmatization. And then the last step for pre-processing is identifying and removing stop words. So stop words are commonly occurring words that for some computational processes provide very little information or in some cases introduce unnecessary noise and therefore need to be removed. So this is particularly the case for tech, text classification tasks. There are other instances where the removal of stop words is either not advised or needs to be more carefully considered. So this, in, this can include any situation where the meaning of a piece of text may be lost by the removal of a stop word. For example, if we were building a chatbot and remove the word not from the phrase, I am not happy, then the reverse meaning may in fact be interpreted by the algorithm. So this would be particularly important for use cases such as chatbots or sentiment analysis. Um, and again, the NLTK Python library has built in methods for removing stop words. All right, so that concludes the um, theoretical portion um, for today. And um, there has been a poll released just now. Um, we're just asking to see kind of what uh, format would you like to see for future sessions? Um, just, uh, you know, if you would like it to be entirely conceptual with a presentation like I just did, if you would like it to be split up half and half between conceptual and then some practical, as in some live coding, or if you would want, you know, slightly more practice and slightly less conceptual, but not exactly 50-50. Um, and I guess we'll give it a little bit uh, more time for everyone to drop in their votes, and then um, I'll end the poll and we can take a look at uh, take a look at the feedback. Um, and in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the Q and A. Um, I can answer them live right now, or if anyone can't. Um, quite think of any questions. Um, if you are part of our Slack channel, there is a channel or Slack uh, community. There is a Slack channel dedicated to the series where you can drop any questions there. Um, and you, you can also privately message myself or anyone else on the panel today. Um, if you have any questions or anything that comes up um, even after today's, uh, today's session. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll. Thank you everyone for voting. Um, so it looks like um, people do kind of like the 50-50 um, split between having um, conceptual, conceptual and the practical components. So that we'll definitely keep that in mind and make sure to kind of keep that going for future sessions. Um, so we're at the 30 minute mark. I'm going to just take a five minute break before we sort of jump into the coding portion. Um, if you click on this link right here um, and I can, we can also make sure that's shared in the chat so people can access that. Um, but basically, if you click on that, then you'll be able to access our um, the Colab, no Colab notebook that we'll be using for today. I'll actually walk you through the process of how to open this notebook properly on your own system before we get started. Um, and then we'll step through the different pre-processing and the EDA as I um, outlined in the presentation. And so let's just take a five minute break. Um, for me, I'm in the Pacific time zone, so it's 531 for me right now. So we'll, we'll resume at 536 or 836 if you're in the Eastern time zone. Thanks, everyone.
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so that concludes our five minute break. Hope everyone has a chance to get up and grab some water or coffee. Um, so hopefully everyone is able to access this link properly. So what I'm going to do is um, just open up that link so that we can kind of step through the process and make sure we're kind of on the same page. So to open a notebook in Colab, all you can do is just type in Colab and um, all you need is a Google account and you'll be able to open any sort of notebook that you would like on your own. And then from here on the top, if you go over to GitHub, it might ask for some authorization and all you have to do is type in the URL. So what I would like you to do is, um, let me actually go to the Women Who Code GitHub. We want to go to the Women Who Code Python one. So let me drop this link in the chat so everyone can access that. So if you want to go into back into our collab uh, notebook and paste the URL that I just put in the chat, you can just paste that in here and then press the search bar. Um, from there, it should load the Women Who Code Python. And let's see, is it? Um, actually, we might have to uh, try something different. Sometimes this can be a little buggy, but let's see. Okay. Let's try something else. If we can go back into the direct repository, which is that where that was. Let me try this and see if that works. Okay, so let me actually, sorry for the confusion. Sometimes the GitHub links get a, get a little bit mixed up, but if you go and paste this link into um, under the GitHub uh, section in your Colab notebook, then you should be able to see this notebook. And then you can just click on this and then it'll open up in your own system. Um, so if everyone, once they're able to get to that step and are able to have the notebook open, um, please put a, um, you can put a B for thumbs up um, and just make sure everyone can get some confirmation. And I'll just wait for a couple more thumbs up before proceeding. I just want to make sure everyone can, um, can access this properly. Okay, cool. So looks like every, at least a few people are able to get to this step. So what we're going to start out by doing first is um, loading in our data set. So the, so the data set I have chosen, you can get the direct link here. It's this um, SMS spam collection data set that I mentioned. So basically, it's this set of SMS labeled messages. So basically, they've been labeled as spam or ham. Ham means um, basically not a spam message. This was originally collected for mobile phone spam research. Um, so what we'll be doing today is um, we won't be building any sort of classification model, but in fact, instead, we're just going to be doing some exploratory data analysis and some pre-processing. Um, so we first want to load in our data set. So what you will want to do is click this link right here next to data set name. That'll take you directly to the data set. And all you have to do is then just click SMS spam collection dot zip. And then that'll automatically download. And then you click on that to unzip it. Um, and then from there, it should open up um, in your system. And what I have done has bas I have basically just saved it to my desktop just so I can very easily retrieve it and then load it into my collab. Um, but I think uh, by default, it'll just download into your um, into your downloads folder directly. So from there, um, once once you have uh, downloaded the file, you can now load it into collab. So all you have to do is you have two options. First, you can press this file icon that has an upward arrow or you can right click in this space right here and click upload. 
And then you go into wherever you have this file saved and then just click this one. So the README is just some information um, on the data set, but what we want is this SMS spam collection. And then just click open, um, press OK um, for that message that pops up. And this data set loads in pretty quickly, so that's pretty nice. Um, so hopefully everyone is able to access the data set and get it properly downloaded. And um, yeah, if everyone can put another thumbs up in the chat to make sure that you all were able to get the data set loaded in so that we can get started on, um, or I guess not loaded in, but just at least uh, downloading it to, to pull that. Um, so for, I think by default, when you um, access the data set, it does come as a zipped file. So you do have to unzip it in order to actually then upload it to Colab. So you will have to unzip it for you to use it. Um, and so I'm just going to proceed with the, with the next step. So PWG is a very popular command, which basically allows you to check which folder you're currently in. So to run any cell in Colab, what you can do is either press this play button or you can press command enter for a Mac or control enter for a Windows. So here we can see that we're in the content folder that basically is telling you that everything on this, um, in this area right here is basically in the content um, folder. And then LS basically lists everything that is in that folder. And as you can see, we have sample data and SMS spam collection. So that's just confirmation that we're in the right place so that when we actually want to load on the data set in the next step, we, the, the system will actually know where to look for it. Um, so the first step is to import the pandas package, which is a very um, popular package used for data science or anything generally done in Python. So um, common practice is to import it and then call it PD, just so it's easier to use it for um, other purposes. And then next for reading in the data set, we're going to be using the read CSV function, or you can also use the read underscore table function, which is part of pandas. And we're going to then name our data set SMS just to make it easier to use. And then here you want to specify exactly where the, the file is located. So we, as we saw up here, it's located inside the content folder and it's called SMS spam collection. So if you run that cell, then you have it successfully loaded in. And so now we can actually print it out to see what does it look like. So as you can see, we have um, two columns, zero and one. We don't really have any sort of labels assigned to the columns, but as you can see, we have ham or spam. So ham meaning it's not a spam message, spam meaning it is a spam message. And then the second column is the message itself. Um, and you can also call the dot head function, which, which is basically another pandas function where you can kind of just get another view of what the file looks like. So the first step of EDA is describing the data. So what you're gonna do is simply do sms.describe and we kind of get this very sort of general high level information about it. So as you can see um, for both zero and one, we have uh, you know, equal counts. There's um, exactly two unique values for zero, meaning that we have ham and spam as our two unique values. Um, and then we have 5,169 unique values for the messages themselves. Um, as you can see, the top is ham, that basically means what is the top value here. Um, and then frequency of zero versus one. Um, so uh, you can also sort of uh, modify this describe function to actually get the count, the mean, standard deviation, minimum and maximum values. But for us, since we're working with text data, um, the mean and all these other numerical quantities don't necessarily mean much to us. But um, if you're working with a different kind of data, then that would definitely be very important. And then next we have data info. So, um, so what we have here is this collection of text data, which um, is very commonly termed as a corpus. So in this corpus, we have 5,572 SMS messages, which are all written in English. And these are serving as our training examples. As you saw up here, the first column is a target variable itself, which is ham or spam. And um, so that basically contains our class labels. And then the second column is the SMS message itself, which is stored as a string. Um, and so since the target variable that we have are spam versus ham, um, since we have that containing discrete values, this becomes a classification task. Um, so what we want to do, uh, do at first is to actually place the target variable in its own table and then try to see how are the two different classes distributed. So the way we do that is I basically just define the first column. So if you just um, use, if you just do SMS and then bracket zero, that's basically taking 
um, the SMS data frame and just taking the first column and we're just defining that to be Y and then we just count up the number of values of that. So as you can see, there's 4,825 ham values and 747 spam values. So there's far fewer training examples for spam than ham and that's from some very clear imbalance. And imbalance of data is not a very good thing. We typically want to be able to have equal values for both, especially when it's a classification task. Um, for our purposes right now, we're just going to continue with that. But if this was in the real world or perhaps for some research purposes, we would want to perhaps get a better data set. Um, and so from here, because we have our, our classification task, we actually want to encode the class labels um, as numbers. So basically, we're going to set spam equal to one and ham equal to zero. And the way we do that is using this label encoder which is something that we can import from scikit-learn, which is again a very um, popularly used library. And so from there, we um, would like to import the pre-processing um, uh, package from scikit-learn, and then we call the label encoder on our uh, Y values up here. And then basically from there, when we print that out, as you can see, it just returns an array of zeros and ones. So basically what we had all the way up here, a series of ham and spam values, all of these get converted into zeros and ones, just to make it a little bit easier um, by encoding this into this um, into a binary function, a binary value. And then from there, um, we actually want to place the all the SMS message data, so that's the second column of the original data set into its own table. Um, so basically, I just take the raw text and take the first column. And as you can see, this is what we get. This is just um, one column and it has just only the messages in there and not any of the labels. Another important part for any data set that you must consider is missing values. So when you have missing values, you can lose expressiveness and this may lead to um, analysis that might be very weak. And so typically what you want to do is see um, uh, how, uh, how many uh, missing values do you actually have and then do you have to actually fill them in, in in some sort of way by padding or if you want to just simply remove any missing values. So a simple way to do that is basically calling pandas again and we say dot is null on our SMS data set. And as you can see here, um, you can't uh, see it fully here, but basically I went through and saw all of them. And in, in our case, we actually see that there is no missing values. So basically it'll return false um, for it uh, not being, um, if it's not null, then um, then we know that it's not a missing value. So luckily in our case, the data is complete, so we don't have to go through and pad any sort of values, but um, that's actually pretty uncommon. Typically, you're going to have some missing values. And then the last step for EDA is basic visualization. So as I mentioned, we can use the Python library Seaborn and Matplotlib to do this. So first, let's import both of these. Um, and then from there, we can do a couple basic visualizations. So the first one, I'm going to display the length of all the instances, specifically the messages themselves. So I'm actually going to first add columns since we don't really have that in our data set. So now we have our label and we have our message here. And then what we wanna do is actually create another column which is called length. And basically that is going to um, print out the length of each of these messages. So for every row, it'll print out the length of that message. And so now we have this third column here. And then I'm going to simply use Seaborn to just uh, create this, uh, this, you know, this histogram plot showing exactly um, how long are each of these individual messages. As you can see, for a length of a little over, or I guess a little under 100, there's quite, there's quite a few um, at that level. But um, basically, this is just one simple vi visualization I did. But um, feel free to look through um, some of these references right here where people have um, done some a little bit more visualization. But just for the interest of time, I'm going to just proceed on from here. And then our second portion for our um, Colab notebook is our pre-processing. So the first step is contraction mapping or expanding contractions. So first we have to install and import the library, which is contractions. Um, so that should install and then import. And as you can see, it's pretty common to um, install and import all these different kinds of libraries. Um, here we have contractions and then later on, we're going to be using the NLTK library as well. So from there, what you wanna do is actually, what I've done here is added another column called no contract, which basically is all of these messages without any any contractions 
and then we apply a lambda function. So a lambda function is kind of like a loop where basically it's going to, going to go through every single um, row in this message column. And basically uh, we call this dot fix, which is part of the contractions library that we just imported. And basically it's going to take each of those words and then split it. So basically if we have a word like don't, it's gonna split it up into do not. Um, and this is, very, this is a very common um, way to use this contractions library. And luckily we don't have a terribly large data set, so it actually does it very quickly. And as you can see here, now we have another column called no contract. Um, and then from there, we would also want each of these expanded contractions to then be tokenized separately, meaning each of these expanded contractions should be considered as its own separate entity. So then from there, we actually create another column called message underscore string. And it's basically we are converting um, all of this, this list of all of these different values um, back into a string. So basically right now in the no contract column, it's one massive list, but basically you want to convert that into one um, large string or into, into, the, into its individual strings. Um, so let's see, let me call that. Okay, yeah, so now we have another column added for message underscore string. Um, and, and under each of these, you can see I have some references listed, uh, which just will point you to some um, more documentation and some more information on what exactly I'm doing in that step. The next step we have is tokenization. So as I mentioned, the NLTK library, which is a natural language toolkit, is very important for um, any sort of NLP, um, uh, NLP task that you're um, taking on. So first we want to import NLTK, uh, and this is just another sort of set of code that you have to uh, make sure to download. And specifically, specifically for tokenization, we're going to be importing the word tokenize. Um, so let's run that. So I'm going to just sort of uh, demonstrate this basic tokenization as I had in the slides. Say we have a text, hi, I would like to tokenize this sentence. And then if we, all we have to do is simply run word tokenize on that text. And as you can see, it prints this out and it treats even the punctuation to the comma and the period at the end are separate tokens as well. And so from there, what we can do is just simply apply this tokenizer to our entire data set. So all we have to do is basically what I've done is created another column called tokenized. And then we call that on the message underscore string since that was our most recently added column. And then we apply this word tokenized function on that. And as you can see, it does that pretty nice and quick. And so now we have this tokenized column. And then next we have noise cleaning. So this is where we remove all of the spaces, special characters, and we actually want to have consistent casing. So we actually lowercase everything. Um, so let's take a small step back. And what I wanna do is just to look at a few random examples of different messages from our data set. So what we can do is call the sample function and just take 5% um, of our data set, just to kind of see what it looks like. So as you can see, there's a lot of, um, you know, random characters, we have some of a semicolon, um, we have some pretty in inconsistent spacing, um, some uncommon characters. So I've, obviously there is a lot of different um, sort of uh, different varies of noise that we do want to get rid of in our data set. So what we can do um, first is we're actually going to transform everything to lowercase. So the way we do that is again with this lambda function and all we have to do is simply call the dot lower function on that and basically that will then lowercase everything and we call that on our tokenized column. And again, we're gonna, we're gonna keep that consistent process of basically creating another column just to show the progress of what we're doing in every single step. So here I'm just gonna call that and as you can see, everything has been lowercased in this new lowercase column. And then next we're going to remove all the punctuation. So to do this, we're actually going to um, import the string and then on um, from string we can actually call in our string dot punctuation and that basically contains all different um, kinds of the punctuation that's present in the English language. So again we're going to have the same sort of pattern where we apply a lambda function and here what it's doing is that it's actually going through everything in the lower column and saying that if that word is not in this punctuation um, sort of library then we want to keep that word. But if there is any sort of punctuation, we would just want it to be removed and that's it. And again, we uh, apply it using a Lambda function. And again, we create a new column called no punk. Um, 
And so as you can see, all of the punctuation has been removed. And next we have our spell checking. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a variety of ways to spell check, but a very common one is Microsoft's text blob. So that's called the Pi spell checker. So we want to first install that before we can actually use it. And then from there, um, I'm actually going to demonstrate just a very simple example of how we implement the spell checker. So what we do is first we have to import the spell checker itself. And what I've done here is um, sort of created a list of different um, words. So we have something is happening here. And basically I call a, a for loop to go through every single one of these words. So it's gonna look at something and then is, and then happening and then here. And then from there, it's going to not only recognize what is misspelled, but also print out um, some, um, some options of what it should, uh, should be spelled as. So first it's gonna print out the most likely answer, and then it's gonna print out some likely options. So as you can see here, it was able to recognize that happening was misspelled and happening was suggested this is the proper spelling as the most likely answer and then some likely options. Um, so that was just some, a very simple example to demonstrate some spell checking. And then our last step of pre-processing is identifying and removing stop words. And again, we uh, will leverage the NLTK, uh, uh, and the NLTK stop words library and we have to make sure to set the language to English. Um, I don't know exactly how many languages they offer, but they do offer quite a few different languages since people all over the world are using NLTK. So let's make sure to download that and import the stop words library. And then again, as I've been doing consistently, um, we're basically going to look at this no punk column since that was our most recently added column and then create a new one called stop words underscore removed. And then using a Lambda function, we're basically gonna say that if a word is not in this stop words library, we want to keep that word. So if a word is a stop word, it's going to be removed. And it's as simple as that. And it does it pretty quickly, which is very nice, even though we have more than 5,000 different um, messages to go through, it does it you know, just in a matter of a second. Um, and then our last step here is stemming and lemmatization. So as I mentioned there, we do have a distinction between stemming and lemmatization. Um, but what I've chosen to do here is lemmatization specifically since it's typically um, a better process um, and it's more popularly done in practice. So here we actually have to download the average perceptron tagger, which is what we need to use for, um, for lemmatization. And then from here, what we actually do is uh, we have to assign some POS tags, which is the parse speech tags. So first we're going to create another column called POS tag. So basically it's gonna look at the no contract column and apply tags to each of those. And this might take a little bit of time because it actually has to go, oh, okay, that took pretty, that didn't take as long. Um, but basically it does have to go through every single word in the message and print out the, the tag, the part, the part of speech tag for it. Um, and then from there, now we can um, use NLTK's word lemmatizer. So the reason why we assign the tags here is because a lemmatizer actually does require these tags. And then from there, it's converted into a format, to a specific format. So what we have here is we're going to first download the WordNet um, lemmatizer. And then from here, this is a little function that, um, that was written up. So basically, if a tag starts with J, then return adjective. So basically, the way that the parts of speech have been tagged um, up here, I'm basically writing a function that corresponds to each of these. So if a part of speech tag starts with the letter J, then we want WordNet to recognize that as an adjective. And then for V, we have verb. For N, we have noun. And then for R, we have adverb. And lastly, we have noun. So this is just, um, a quick function that I um, wrote up. Was, there's different ways to do this, but that's just kind of a very nice and simple way um, to go from the parts of speech tagging to our limitization. So from there, we're going to create another column just like I did, and now it's able to create um, the parts of speech, but just in the WordNet format that the limitizer actually requires. And then lastly, we can now do our limitization, which is our final step for pre-processing. So from here, we have to first import the WordNet limitizer from NLTK. And then we basically, just like we've been doing, we call it in using a Lambda function where we call the lemmatizer on the word with the tag that's associated with it. And we're looking at the WordNet pause, the most recent column that was just created. 
and then we create a new column called lemmatized. And so let's call that. And so now that concludes all of our different steps for pre-processing. We went through um, some exploratory data analysis and the six steps of pre-processing, like I mentioned um, in the slides. And so something that's really important is to save your work. Um, I can't em emphasize enough how many times I've gone through and just forgot to save my work and then I lost hours of work. So what you wanna do is make sure to save this um, newly updated um, SMS um, data set into a new CSV file. And you can do that very simply by just saving it as SMS spam collection dot CSV or whatever you would like to call it. And then once you run that, it probably takes between 15 to 20 seconds, maybe not as long, but basically you'll see a, a new file pop up here in your file system. Um, I'm just gonna wait for that to show up and then uh, we'll switch back to the slides and just have some recap and wrap up for today's session. Um, so as you can see here, we have our newly created CSV file. So basically if you were to open that, it would now, it would look like everything like in here. So all the new columns I've created and you can kind of see all of the steps of pre-processing and um, you see the progress of, of your work. And so at the bottom, we have some references. Um, these were all used for um, the spam ham classification, some pre-processing methods that I used. And I would highly encourage um, going through those links and reading a little bit on your own as well. Um, so I'm going to jump back to the slides since that concludes our coding portion for today. Um, and before I jump into the slides, I want to release one last poll. Um, let me just pull that up. Let's see. Okay, so um, I'm going to have just launched a poll and basically we are considering um, including a project in between the, um, the later, late, later sessions, probably after the second or third session. Um, and so we just want to get some interest levels, seeing if people would be interested in this, because um, then we can start planning ahead for that. Um, and yeah, I'll just give it a few more seconds so people can vote and then I'll, I'll end the poll. And um, yeah, please uh, drop any questions in the Q&A box. Um, and once I've gone through, just there's just a few more slides left to go through. And once I complete those, then I'll address any questions that are in the Q&A. Um, so I'm gonna end the poll now. And it looks like people do have uh, quite a bit of interest in um, a project. So we're gonna keep that in mind and hopefully we can get, um, get that started. So from there, we're gonna just do some recap and next steps. Um, so as you guys all saw today, we went through some text pre-processing, we went through some EDA, um, as well as some um, representat representation with tokenization. Um, there are some more steps with vectorization that we didn't quite get to, but we aim to do that in a future session. Um, and then after that, we have some, you know, actually building the models and then deploying and evaluating the models. Um, so uh, that concludes all the content for today's session. Our next session will be on October 25th from 8 to 9.30 p.m. EDT. Uh, and that'll be focused on NLP and deep learning. Um, right now, this is a monthly series. So uh, we're basically going to have it the last Sunday of every month. Um, and we're, we're going to try to keep that consistent for the next few months. Um, here are some upcoming events. And you can actually find this on the Women Who Code Python website. So tomorrow, we actually have an event um, on open source contribution. Um, and then the following week, we will be having the beginner Python study group, the session four, um, second part of data types. And then um, that's a recurring series happening every two weeks. And then please uh, stay connected with us on social media. We have an Instagram, a Twitter, and a LinkedIn. Um, and this is our, um, our handle for all of those accounts, as well as our website, womenwhocode.com uh, backslash Python. And um, now I can take any questions that anyone has, please do join our Slack channel. You can find that at Discover NLP with Python. Um, all you could do is um, above, uh, next, right next to channels, there's a plus button. If you click on that, then you can browse through channels and you can um, search for this uh, 
services channel and it should pop up. And please, um, I hope everyone um, took, uh, took something great from today's session and I hope everyone can join next month as well. And if anyone has any questions, I'll address those right now. Um, so I see something about if these libraries include slang, acronyms, shorthand, etc. cetera. Um, as far as I know, I'm, I'm not too sure. I mean, I guess some contractions can fall under um, slang, but I guess it's not really directly slang. Um, I know that there are some more uh, specific libraries that I didn't cover today that definitely deal with acronyms and basically expanding an acronym, just like you can expand a contraction. Um, I don't have those libraries handy with me right now, but they definitely do exist out there. Um, if you would like me to follow up on that uh, with you, please uh, send me a message on Slack and I can find that for you and um, send that information over to you. Um, and I think there was a message in the chat that I saw a bit earlier. Um, someone was having an issue with um, running the WordNet lemmatizer uh, piece of code. So let me actually go back to that and open it up. Um, let's see. So let me find that line of code where that was. Um, Let's see. Trying to make sure I find the right. Okay, I think this is the line of code. Okay, so this one here. So what we're doing here, um, this is a final step for our limitization where after adding the parts of speech tag, specifically what word that needs, then we call the limitizer on there. Um, so uh, I think it's uh, Ina or um, Inna, I think it was your question um, regarding that. If, um, if you, I see that you said that it's not running, if you could maybe in the chat, if you could drop exactly, um, drop a message explaining exactly what um, the error message is that might help me to figure out maybe why it's not running properly. Um, I haven't had an issue. Okay, okay, you're okay. All right, no worries. Um, I just wanted to make sure that your question was, uh, was addressed. Um, yeah, I guess uh, we're um, past an hour at this time. So I think I'll give it just a couple more minutes if anyone has any last minute questions. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I think we can conclude for today's session, um, but feel free to stay on if you do have any questions and I hope to see you for next month's session. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great evening, um, day. Um, I'm not sure where, where everyone is joining from, but um, I hope everyone had a great weekend and thank you for joining.